everybody! Welcome to Pale in Comparison. In this podcast, my sister uses her knowledge of the other verse to take a look at Pact, while those least appreciated work, and I try to not give away any spoilers. I'm Jenny, and Malia convinced me to read Worm. I'm Malia, and Jenny convinced me to read everything else. This episode, we are covering Bonds, Chapter 1.2. Before we get into that, however, I'd like to issue a spoiler warning. This podcast will be filled with pale spoilers. If you don't know whether Miss ever comes back to Kennet and don't want us to tell you, stop now, read Pale, and come back to this podcast. As for Pact, there will be full spoilers to the chapter that we are covering. The funny thing about those spoiler warnings that I'm thinking of is like, Pale is still being written, and so Jenny and I don't know some of the things that we're saying. I mean, that's true, but I mean. You'll know someday. We'll figure it out someday. Oh, well, maybe not. You never know. <laughs> You might never know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we're going to just go over Bonds 1.2. Should be a little bit of a shorter episode, just because it's a little bit less... Action-packed. Well, it's super action-packed, yes. But <laughs> um, a little bit less, like, things to obsess over. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, we'll start with a chapter summary here, and then we'll get into talking about it. Blake borrows a car from essentially the best landlord in the world and heads out with Rose. He tries to get some answers from Rose, but unfortunately doesn't get much information from her. A spooky figure in the middle of the road seems to tamper with the car and it breaks down, so they have to proceed on foot. After a suspenseful chase and almost falling through an icy pond, Blake makes it to safety. What did you think of this chapter, Malia? It was great. I mean, Rose! Rose is a thing! And like, Molly's dead and it's really sad, but... (laughs) <laughs> There's both, like, here's some substance, and also, like, haha, we're going to throw some random others at you. And I spent some time trying to figure out what they are, and I don't know, and I'm embarrassed. I feel like this is just going to be the whole rest of this podcast forever. It's going to be me being like, oh, that was a ghoul that was super obvious. Ha ha, I suck. But it's okay. I mean, it's all right. It's just part of the process. Um, <laughs> I do have to say that your tone when you said Molly's dead, and that's really sad, just <laughs> didn't sound that convincing that that was really sad. It's really sad. Okay. I mean, you can try to convince me now, but okay. it's too late. Um, <laughs> no, it is really sad, actually. Um, that was a bummer. Anyway, we'll, I'm going to go ahead and start, or go ahead and break this part piece by piece. So we start off by Blake running down the stairs, basically trying to wrap his head around everything that's happening. So he's thinking a lot about the dream and mostly like Molly. Mm. That's quite a terrible thing to wake up to. Before we get into like the serious part of molly the very first note i wrote down for this chapter was toke like edith is this a thing in canada edith wears a toke in the prologue and i was like what is this Mm -hmm. and i googled it at the time and it was like a short brimmed hat something something that women wear and i was like cool and so when i'm reading this i'm like wait why is like wearing a woman's hat and maybe he is but i googled it again and i think in canada it's also basically like a beanie like a knit beanie Ah, and I was like, "Oh, that just makes sense." But now I'm like, "Wait, what was Edith wearing?" We just don't know. I mean, I guess if you think about the name Beanie, like that doesn't really make a lot of sense, at least to me. Unless there's some really obvious thing, but I'm like, it doesn't look really like a bean. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> toque sounds a little more dignified than a beanie, at least. Saying like, "Oh, yeah, I'm no, I- my toque," or like, "I'm getting my I beanie like on." But- yeah. I don't, yeah. No, I totally had to Google it, too. I was like, I don't know what what this is, if this is, like, a scarf, or if this is, like, if she's, like, having a toke of something. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, Yeah, it doesn't help that, like, I've lived for one year in real winter, and have you ever lived in real winter? Well, we are in Texas, and we did just have an exciting week, right. so technically, yes. <laughs> But you didn't have the opportunity to like purchase outdoors. Oh cold no! Gear no, before. we were so dreadfully un- underprepared. It was. We might not know what it that was bad. Is. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't know what that is. I had a bunch of winter stuff that I ordered just before then um, that hey. just came in now. And then now oh. that it's yeah, back to like seventies weather, um, which is great. So that's all right. If it happens again, I'll now have my winter gloves and snow mm. pants. <laughs> But anyway, uh, no, I have not really lived in real winter. So, tokes. Tokes. God only knows. All right. So the the thing I really got out of this section was him talking about Molly. 
And we we had talked about this a bit last time, I think. I'm having a little bit of a hard time remembering what I talked to you about in the conversation to like start this podcast and then then like what we've talked about on the podcast, but mm-hmm. that won't be a problem from now on. Anyway, um <laughs> why hadn't she called me? Like because he does at the end of the chapter say, "Hey Molly, like do you need my help? Like let me know." And Callan like fucks that up. Yeah. Which maybe is like I'm still on my karmic law thing, right? So I'm like, is that a was that a karma moment where Callan just happens to like totally undercut that? as legitimate like i'm actually trying to help you thing like in that moment or is he just like i mean he's a dick but like because it seems like she almost was like oh blake is someone i can maybe trust and then callan totally undercuts it but while he's thinking about this blake thinks about molly as the child she had been 10 years ago and i'm like wait have you not seen molly in 10 years you ran away three years ago. What happened during those seven years? Because it seems like y'all hang out, hung out as children. How far away do y'all live from each other? Mm-hmm. It didn't seem like people were living that far. But like no one else lived in Jacob's Bell, I guess. I just... That was weird. I mean, I don't know if it necessarily means he hasn't seen her for like 10 years. I think it just like that's where their happy childhood memories were from. And so that's kind of what he's mm. reaching towards. That's kind of what I took it as, at least. Yeah. I, I mean, it also seemed odd that Blake was like, Molly, why why didn't she call me when, like, he didn't reach out to Molly or Paige when he ran away? But on the other hand, he had just seen her and been like, hey, please talk to me. Uh-huh. And they're more like adults now, and so they have a little bit more agency and stuff. But it was just, it was just really sad. But also, like, what is Molly going to say? Like, hi, Blake, magic yeah. is real. Like, come to the house. Like, I'm about to die. And maybe you will, too. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> I mean, also, if you bring it back to Pale, though, like, think about, like, all the aware and mm-hmm. how, you know, the protagonists in Pale, like, they can't exactly just go around telling everybody. Mm-hmm. And because there's consequences for them if they do that, right? So it's like, she could call for help, but, like, besides actually, like, awakening him and everything and bringing all that responsibility onto her, mm-hmm. you know, what can he really do? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let her borrow his crappy motorcycle. I'm sure it's a wonderful motorcycle. He just thinks it's crappy or he said it's crappy. So, right. I mean, I'm not sure what, yeah, like what Blake could do. I think he has like an older motorcycle. So, or like it's, you know, not as new and expensive or whatever, but I, I don't know that he could have necessarily helped, but like we got more of the story. So Blake presumably survives. And so he's, I mean, maybe it's not him. You don't know anything. Okay. Fair. But maybe Rose is better at the practice or something and like helps Blake through the whole thing. Seems like he could have done something. And keep in mind, you're still, I mean, you have a very good guess that I'm not telling you if it's right <laughs> or not, but we still don't know exactly what kind of practicing grandma Rose has been doing. Right. And I still don't know what karmic law <laughs> practice is. Okay. I mean, <laughs> that's, I guess that's true, but it, it sounds, it sounds cool. It sounds cool. But speaking of karma, I was thinking maybe like, because Blake was like, I mean, he he never said everything in our family was great until dot, dot, dot. But he does say like Paige and Molly were like the two good things for my family. And I'm wondering, like, is the family shit because of karma or are they shit just because they suck? Maybe it's both. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you might find out more later, but might also just be like, actually, these people are secretly really wonderful and you just don't know it but you know you don't know we'll find out (laughs) yeah one last thing before i move on speaking of my predictions blake explicitly refers to the guy and the girl the man and the woman whatever in their 20s with the pizza boxes and the metronome as witch hunters check confirmed (laughs) done i'm right right. obviously (laughs) but i mean i i hope that they are even more now because while both throughout this chapter does a whole bunch of things with words that are very hilarious that I'll probably point out that are very funny for someone who knows what's going on and wouldn't stand out as strange at all for someone who doesn't. And I enjoyed those parts a lot. Mm-hmm. And that is potentially one of them if they are witch hunters, which I hope they are. They very well might be. So basically gets down all those stairs, knocks on his landlord's door, ends up waking him up criminally early and essentially trades vehicles to really dumb it down. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, Joel is so great. And it reminds me a lot of the stuff we were kind of talking about last chapter, Shocker. How Joel is kind of like part of Blake's new family, like Blake's new support system. Yeah. Blake is like, yeah, he knows I'm not going to accept the hug. And so it's like, oh, like Joel is one of the people who's been there for him and who understands. I just feel all like warm and happy in this moment, even though it's scary because he just is obviously like really loved and really supported and cared for. But also like he has an active role in the community. Like he more, more points for Blake is artsy was helping to set up for Goosh's show, which like, what the fuck does that mean? No one knows. Um, Seems (laughs) awesome. And also Joel is like a, a landlord and I've never been friendly or anything with a landlord and like he obviously just cares so much for Blake and it makes me feel like it's not just Blake but that he's part of this community that really cares for each other Mm -hmm. of like awesome artsy queer people no for sure I mean not like I'm saying all my landlords in the past have been like terrible or anything but I mean there's landlords I mean they definitely would never give me their car their car (laughs) never (laughs) even if I had keys to trade them like there's no freaking well I mean, in our landlords, I mean, at least my landlords, like, usually were at a totally different building, so mm-hmm. I couldn't get there anyway. <laughs> but yeah, so that was a kind of a nice surprise, I feel like, to read about and be like, wow, this guy is fantastic. Blake, you, like, did good with... Well, because especially because he's, like, he runs up to the door and it's like, I knock on my landlord's door and it's like, what? Like, what the hell and are then you it's doing? Like, <laughs> and he's really annoyed and it's like, I need your car. And I'm like... What? Like, why? Do, why do you think this is gonna work? Yeah, and then immediately he's just like, "Oh, baby, I'm so sorry," and I'm just like, "Oh, it's funny too because he's like my bear of a landlord," and I don't remember if I got it the first time, but it's funny because he's a bear because he's gay, and so it's I'm like just picture him as this like big kind of hairy man who's really good at hugs because I was like, "Oh, is he?" And then he's like, he calls him baby. Um, he talks about the show and the sisters, which like. I guess I'm assuming the sisters are trans. They might not be, but it was just kind of like, oh, this seems like a lovely place. And I kind of hope we never see Joel again because maybe he lives if we never see him again. <laughs> well, all right. Well, we will see. But yeah, he's pretty wonderful. That part when the lights like went out um, and like mm-hmm. Rose is behind and or, or like, you know, trying to like make motions like hurry up, you know, Ooh, creepy, right? <laughs> yeah. It also made me wonder about, like, we haven't talked about who and what maybe Rose is yet, but she's, she doesn't speak in that situation. And I was kind of like, Hey, um, why? Like, I I was wondering if, could Joel hear her if she talked? Maybe she didn't know if he would be able to hear her or not. Maybe she didn't want Blake to like start speaking back to her and be like, Oh, the crazy guy. Why? What's going on? Cause I was like, presumably Joel wouldn't be able to hear or see her, but maybe he would. And that was just sort of an interest or maybe she didn't know. But yeah. I really appreciated her attempt to save Joel, even though it was not confirmed that something bad would have happened to him. It seems like it could have. It probably would have. I mean, yeah, I was like, go back to sleep, bro. Like, yeah, go sleep it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was a really amazing balance of tension and security in that moment where, like, I felt really safe, like, standing there with Joel. I know. Which was so great and really warm. But then also, like... There's a girl like freaking out and like, you have to go, you have to go. And like, that was a really like great. I don't know. It was like, I both felt safe and protected, but also like tense and freaking out. Yeah, it's a good contrast. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like it kind of helped lighten it a little bit, but then kind of brought you right back into the moment. Like, oh, yeah, we kind of have to go immediately. (laughs) Yep. Um, (laughs) All right. Well, basically, the next part gets in the car. Basically, while driving, Blake attempts to grill Rose on what the heck is happening. It's not very successful. She doesn't seem to really know that much more, or at least she's not telling him. What did you think about, I guess, what she was telling, like, her explanation on, like, what she is? See, I feel like you're just, like, way more sus of Rose or whatever than I was at this point. I was just, I mean, I'm still, like... I believe her and I trust her and I love her. Hey, I'm not saying anything one way or the other. I'm not saying anything one way or the other. I'm just saying, like, we don't know. Like, she could be 100% honest. I mean, granted, I actually do know, but I'm not telling you. (laughs) Like, um, she could be 100% honest. She could not be. I'm really not trying to push you one way or the other. I'm just saying. Right. Well, I mean, I think that 
one of the really interesting things was she admits uh, that she doesn't know if she's she doesn't know if she's telling the truth. Like she doesn't know if she's like been created and manipulated or whatever mm-hmm. somehow and is like going to fuck Blake over. She just kind of knows like or I, I really believe her that she's like being as honest as she can. There are moments where it's like she tells him how Molly died later and different things. But I kind of think like she wasn't purposely being evasive. It was just kind of like, holy shit, we have to go. Holy shit. There's another. Yeah. Holy shit. And so I really like her. But I'd like to talk a little bit about what she is. Yeah, for sure. OK, so it seems like Rose came into existence when Molly died is kind of what I'm kind of what it seems thinking. Like. Yeah. Right. And I think that Rose is like a manifestation of all of the like desires that his parents had to have had a daughter, like wishing Blake was a girl for so long. Like maybe is somehow it reminds me of like an echo or like a humans can manifest others and different things. Yeah. And I don't think his parents did it, but I think that somehow his grandma was able to because Rose says grandmother is trying to game the system somehow. And I think that grandma has somehow manifested Rose into being or something based on like those desires and impulses. I don't know why she's in a mirror. It reminds me a little bit of Ken in Pale. Like, I don't think like grandma had to go ask some like judges or whatever to like make Rose because it's not really the same level or anything at all. Okay. But I, I just kind of like the idea of like, like the concept of a thing becoming manifest. Sure. And I just feel like really bad for her the way she describes the environment she's in that Mm -hmm. it's just darkness everywhere except for like where the light through mirrors comes in but it's not all mirrors it's just the ones on the house and the ones by Blake and she had to like blindly leap to where Blake was and is like going to be lost in the darkness or something if he leaves she's like I don't feel like I experienced any of my memories which is like why I think she was recently created I don't know if that's the right word and she doesn't respond to the cold and she she's like my heartbeat like doesn't feel real mm-hmm. and that's just like eh, like that's scary yeah <laughs> it's really scary and especially mm-hmm. because I was thinking the first time I read it oh she's just kind of gonna be there at the next mirror but then when I was really trying to think like no what is this experience like I think she might have to run and like physically follow where Blake is hmm okay I mean, she had the weird, like, I jumped to him thing or whatever, but I think it makes some sense. I guess she can, like, ride in vehicles. Like, if if she can see the vehicle, she can, like, ride in it or whatever if there's light there. Uh-huh. But it seems like, because I was thinking it was like a, like a Zoom call if I'm sitting at a computer and someone else is, like, walking around and showing me their apartment. But I don't think that's what it is. I don't think she just sits in front of the mirror. I think she has to physically, like, get to the next, like, if the mirror is moving... But I'm not positive. It's just like that was the physicality that made sense to me. I don't know if she like winks out of existence when there's no reflection, but she was very worried about being left in the car. Okay. Yeah. And I'm worried that, I don't know. I'm kind of wondering. So I know like she basically was like, I'm you, except that I'm Mm -hmm. a girl, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, at least to me, when I first read this, it seemed kind of obvious. Like they don't have the same personality, right? Mm -hmm. At least... And not, not just that, but, like, when they were talking about their families and stuff like that, like, she was still living at home, or he moved out, like, three years ago, right? Mm-hmm. It seems like they have different family lives, too. Yeah, I mean, she didn't seem, like, completely thrilled with her parents. She was kind of like, yeah, they were, like, really mad at me for not getting the house. Mm-hmm. But I, I guess I kind of just chalked that up to, like, they would have treated Blake better if he was a girl. Ah, uh, um, okay, like, that's he, fair. he wouldn't have had a lot of different problems he wouldn't have felt like he needed to leave because it seems like he left in large part because he felt a lack of like attention and love from his parents. Uh And I think that Rose probably got more. Didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. This is kind of random. I'm I'm kind of like something popped into my head in terms of comparing pale Uh in terms of one of the characters. So you're talking about like, you know, she pretty much popped into existence in terms of like, I don't know. I was kind of wondering like, what do you think about, like, comparing her to, like, Tashlet? In terms of Tashlet, uh, like, you know, she grew up totally normal. And she didn't realize she was another until she kind of just turned into another. It was kind of, like, it's drastic change. Yeah. I actually did think about that a little bit while I was reading. Like, one of my questions is, is Rose an other? 
And I want to say yes. Okay. Based on my theory that she just like popped into existence and she lives in this mirror verse and stuff. Like, I don't think that qualifies as human. Yeah. And I did kind of think like, oh my gosh, to go your whole life and then suddenly you're something else. But it's like mm-hmm. Rose didn't go her whole life. She has these like artificial memories of her whole life, mm-hmm. like simulated. But she feels like she did though, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's just got to be real traumatic. And like, I love Tashlet and I hope that I love Rose as much as I love Tashlet. Tashlet is way more chill about all that stuff than I would be. I'm just saying. Yes. Like, oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> I, I think that, that Tash, but... I mean, a lot of it is just like a lot of her personal strengths, I think. Yeah. But on one hand, I'm like, she doesn't have an option. True. Like, there's but nothing else. Can still freak the hell out if right. they don't have an option, you know? But right. it is kind like of Melissa. awesome that she doesn't. Well, Melissa, can't, you could say that she does have an option, <laughs> but she's just not really. That's true. She could be making things better for herself, but. And ta- yeah, Tashlet totally could just like wallow in misery or like lash out at people or like do a bunch of things yeah but i I think she's decided that the her best way forward is to just kind of like accept what's happening and then Mm -hmm. make the exactly and so i guess we'll see what rose does and i don't think Mm -hmm. she's like not insinuating she's gonna wallow or anything like that but it is a big like a big change right well so i was thinking when you were formulating the question that you were going to talk about snowdrop because snowdrop Mm. i mean Snowdrop the possum still existed before the Forest Ribbon Trail, but was kind of like True. manifest into existence as Snowdrop as a combination of like Avery. And it seems like Rose. I mean, maybe Rose isn't a lot of Blake. Maybe Rose is just she doesn't come from who Blake is now. She comes from like what could have happened if Blake had been mm. raised differently. OK, I thought that was interesting. That is interesting. I'm not going to lie. I didn't think about that, but that is possibly a better fit or at least. Just as good of a fit. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. So we talked about the line of secession, which is kind of interesting, too. I get that. Or what did you think about about that? I guess I'll just ask you. What do you think about that? I don't know if Grandma Rose hates Molly or loves Molly or like either thinks really poorly of Molly or thinks really good of Molly. I don't think she thinks poorly of Molly, but like presumably she was like, Molly has the best chance of making this work. But she was also like, Molly's gonna die almost like molly's gonna have to face all this like horrible shit right like like i I think a lot about charles and like don't do this like don't say yes like don't take the deal yeah and being like lol this grandchild's gonna have to go through all of this and i can't i don't know why i I don't understand molly enough especially because Paige is at the bottom and Paige was like compared to grandma by blake he was like y'all like they're really similar and Paige was like seemed great she's last and it just really draws me back to the peter page thing where like he must have said something really bad or she must have said something really bad or grandma must have like read into something yeah i also have like very unformed thoughts about peter and page and like blake and rose because like peter and page are twins and like blake and rose are sort of twins okay and like it seems like blake like the shenanigans are that blake can be in this line of secession because rose exists but doesn't exist like i think that like rose's essence is what allows blake to be in this line Mm -hmm. and i don't know if peter's essence like fucks page over or yeah it seems like there might be something okay interesting it's molly and then blake slash rose and then it's birth order until page gets thrown in at the end and yeah like the the two and a half year old is put over over page Page. yeah yeah or page (laughs) or actually or like or maybe yay? like yay page it's, again but she's very unclear yes true all right the lawyer kind of helps rose out that's like what she was talking about as well the lawyer kind of gives her a little bit of info he basically tells her everything that that she knows right now that she's trying to relate to blake right so the lawyer is definitely i want to say definitely a practitioner like the lawyer knows what's up yeah <laughs> all right we established that the lawyer knows what's up <laughs> he knows what's up for sure yeah, so they basically talk about Rose's memories and the kind of differences between, well, a little bit the differences between her and Blake's. Like, he doesn't really go into it because he's a little suspicious. Like, the more he talks to her, the more he's like, I don't know if I can really trust you because I'm not 100% sure if you're being, like, straight with me, you know? Yeah, any other thoughts on this section or keep on moving? I wrote in the notes, I, I was trying to think, okay, if Blake were to die, what would happen to Kathy? How would she find out? 
Does she have some sort of doppelganger or whatever, like living in her head or her mirror or whatever? I don't think so. I don't know what would happen to any of the other women in line. Mm -hmm. Maybe they get a phone call from the lawyer or something. (laughs) I don't know why Blake didn't get a phone call. But like, and then I was like, oh, wait, you know, is Rose another? And then I was like, is she a doppelganger? And then I was like, what, wait, what even are doppelgangers? I think doppelgangers like take over people's bodies and like lives. And I don't necessarily think she's that. Mm -hmm. She could be. (laughs) She's not being very sneaky. Yeah. I really, I really hope she gets out of the mirror and like becomes manifest as a full person and lives a nice life because I like her. I like everyone named Rose (laughs) in this story. (laughs) We'll go ahead and move on with that then. So basically after talking with Rose a bunch, ends up seeing this really tall figure in the middle of the road with the creepy bird masks, ends up passing. And he's like, okay, I guess that's fine. Rose is like, uh, he's definitely like still here. (laughs) Um, And he's like, uh, I don't see anything. But the car proceeds to die along with, I want to say all the other electronics or at least his phone. Um, dies yeah, I as think well. it just mentions his phone. Yeah, I don't know if there's other electronics in the car, but yeah, his phone dies as well. So he grabs the tire iron and uh, rips off the, I think, rear view mirror um, mm-hmm. and proceeds on foot. This was intense and great. I was, I was, I'm trying to figure out awareness. I feel like we we talk about like the aware and stuff in Pale, but I feel like I still don't fully understand mm-hmm. because I'm like, okay, is Blake aware at this point? Like, is that why he can see the other? Or is it a practitioner with a crazy mask who's mm-hmm. eight feet tall? Hmm. I mean. Could be a thing. Could be a thing. Yeah. Glamour. Except not. This, these are not fairies. That's a prediction that if it's fairies, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because Blake can see this thing, but he doesn't sense like Rose does. And I was like, okay, is Rose more aware because she knows that it's like latched on or whatever. But then maybe her like super other powers allow her to know things like that because she's like oh i knew that something bad was in the the apartment building or whatever and so i don't know if that's like the site for like mirror people or like i yeah i can't tell if she's a normal aware and blake isn't or if blake's a normal aware and she isn't or what but i spent some time trying to figure out and have a good guess for what this other is i don't I, I think it is an other. I don't think they're practitioners. I don't think practitioners okay. would necessarily be eight feet tall. But also um, the way they describe the hands is really creepy. And um, I also think that a practitioner wouldn't follow directions as precisely for as long when it was like not mes- necessarily going to work anymore like they do at the pond, presumably. But yeah, I, I tried to figure out what kind of other this is. And I don't know. The themes are it drains energy. I don't, maybe it can suck your life away. I just, I was like, um, what sort of like manifestation of draining energy? Cause the gas and then the, the phone battery. Right. But then the long cloak is like a bunch of tanned skins, which is gross True. or maybe not that gross. I don't know. And then the bird skull and the antlers. I'm like, okay, so there's like some like wild foresty, scavengery predator e type vibes Mm -hmm. it kind of reminds me i don't remember the descriptions for these avery fights the things in the ruins the incarnate things did Mm. one of them have like an antler skull or something okay (laughs) like the hunt like hunt or something this they they don't act like that but maybe that sort of vibe i almost thought you were gonna be like, oh, it drains energy and stuff, so it must be like some kind of tech thing. <laughs> oh. No, I no, I didn't think so. Um, I'm assuming there's not a lot of technomancy in this book, and I'm assuming there's not a lot of Why are oni, you if stuff? any oni in this book, because there's a decent amount in Pale, which is probably dumb. Because I, mean, I assume there are a lot of fairies in this book, and a lot of goblins, but... Why is that? that that's, I'm just curious, like, that's kind of interesting. People seem to have opinions on fairies and goblins. Mm, and they didn't People have... didn't seem to have opinions, especially on Oni, but also on like Technomancers. Okay. Because sometimes I'm like, maybe it's Oni, but like, I don't think Oni are really going to be in this. I could be wrong. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Interesting. It's okay if you're wrong. I mean, what are they going to do? It's fine. <laughs> you're going to be like, eh, she doesn't like, know oh my things. Gosh, she, doesn't, stop listening. she didn't read the book. And so she doesn't <laughs> know things. Yeah, it's fine. It's all right. Okay. I mean, they'll, they'll get over it, you know? <laughs> I mean, if they don't, then they probably should talk to someone. Because <laughs> that's mm-hmm. kind of a weird thing to get 
get stuck up on. But anyway. <laughs> um, um, before we leave the section, I was yes. thinking a lot. I was very focused on the car because I was like, this is Joel's car. And like, <laughs> what's Joel going to think? And is Joel ever going to get his car back? I was very happy that Blake gave him his, his bike's keys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, that's really nice. And like, especially on the, the reread, I was like, oh man, Blake is not going to get that car back to him. I mean, hopefully he gets it back. But when they like ripped the rear view mirror off, I was like, that had to happen. But bummer. And I was like, somebody's going to find that tire iron. And it's, but, but yeah. Blake locks the car. And I was like, good job, Blake. <laughs> wonderful there you go i know you saved that suit he's got in his trunk and <laughs> roller roller skates i think roller blades oh i know no. i'm not gonna lie when i was reading that i was like why doesn't he try to put those on and like skate to to freedom he'd probably fall in like the snow the snow oh i guess that's a good reason never mind <laughs> would have just involved me paying a little more attention to what now i was I'm just thinking about joel and his like gayness in the shows. I wonder, do they do some sort of like roller skating show? Anyway. All right. I think that's time to move on. <laughs> I'm really curious. I, I need the prequel to Pact where we learn all about gay, like Blake's fun gay life. Um, I don't know if he's gay, but he might be. He might be. So Blake ends up getting chased. Starts off by that one creepy bird dude who catches up. Basically makes it seem like either wants him to get hit by a car or go get lost in the woods and freeze to death. And so Blake ends up going into the woods because he's like, I basically can't just sit still and do nothing. I have to act, I have to run, do something. Ends up that, I believe a total of four of the creepy bird people show up. Um, one of them has like three masks, gets cornered at this icy pond. It's really creepy because the guy with the three masks seems to have a mask just for Blake, whatever the hell that means. Basically manages to break the ice and topple this couple of those bird people in there with Rose's help. And then he makes his way to safety after that. So Blake did real good. Blake did. Yeah. Blake and Rose did solid. They're a good duo. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Rose was not really there for a good amount of it because the, <laughs> the mirror got real fogged up. Blake's wits and things figured things out, but Rose did make a nice sacrifice, arguably to save her own skin at the end, which was good. Yeah. No, that was good. I, I felt kind of frustrated with Rose when I first read this. Not very fairly. I got it. Okay. Admit. Tell me, tell me more. I mean, okay, and granted, I know this isn't fair because if I was stuck in a mirror, scared to death, I probably would be acting exactly the same way. But just, you know, Blake, you can tell he's all about action. He's like the one trying to do all this stuff. I feel like Rose, she's kind of stuck. You know, it's not like she can be out there doing all that stuff. But a few times she would say things like, oh, like, you have to have a plan. Or like, if you're going to move. And he was like, well, do you have any fucking ideas? And she just like, didn't say anything. And was like, you know, I know what you're saying, but. Since he's obviously in the more precarious situation, at least, like, in the immediate... Like, we don't know what's going to happen to her if he dies, so it might be just as bad. But you'd think she'd be trying to come up with a few more ideas or just something. She definitely did step it up when she broke helped to break that, that ice, for sure. But mm-hmm. it was just kind of frustrating because she... I felt like every time she mentioned something, she'd be like, oh, like... Yeah, you gotta have a plan, or like, if you're gonna, I don't know what to say, or, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I just got kind of frustrated by that. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I, I get what you're saying, that you've pointed it out. I think mm-hmm. I just, like, related really hard, where I was yeah. like, yeah, Blake, you need a plan? <laughs> you can't, <laughs> what are you doing? As a reader, I was like, yeah, Blake, go. But as, like, a person, I was like, yeah, like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I wouldn't, I mean, maybe I would. I've never been in a situation, like, anything near like that. Um, but I really related to the freaking out and stuff. And I guess the like her not telling him some things and not contributing as much wasn't proof of her trustworthiness. Mm-hmm. But I think that she's overwhelmed. She yeah. doesn't even necessarily know what is important in the moment or what's not important. And I think that like the, the things that were great, they seem to kind of actually work well together. Yeah. Because Blake's like, this is like, tell me a direction. Like, this is what I need. True. And she just, you know, she does it and he's able to kind of snap her out of her panic and maybe inspire her to break the ice or help him break the ice. But I think that Blake is going to get into a lot of 
bad shit because he doesn't sit down and think things through. And I bet it's also going to save his life a bunch like it does here. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I get what your question was earlier that they have strong personality differences. But to me, this is like Blake is a deeply traumatized person. He doesn't want people to touch him. He doesn't whatever. And I'm assuming that a lot of that has to do with like the three years since he's been home and also like the lack of love he felt from his family. Sure. Yeah. So I think, again, like Rose hasn't had these experiences and is like coming from a much more privileged place than Blake is. Mm -hmm. Weirdly, because she's in a mirror. (laughs) Well, yeah, but. (laughs) But yeah, I, I think that that was really interesting yeah no it's definitely really interesting he lost his scarf which was very sad oh that was sad um, he also loses his toque r.i.p toque that's even more tragic because <laughs> we need we need tokes i mean you know <laughs> i mean lose yeah. both that's just really like not cool no <laughs> also interestingly just like a lovely little tidbit of info um just to really raise the morale while they're in this like precarious situation you know Rose mentions that Molly was clawed to death um, which is also just oof Oof. makes it so much worse than I mean not I mean any kind of death is bad but you know clawed to death and being partially eaten that's not a great way to go that's real bad yeah that's real bad I mean and just like how scary it is and how she must have been like chased and how like how scary this is but Blake has figured out some ways to not get attacked whereas Molly just straight up didn't have that and she probably knew more about like what was chasing her than Blake does at this point and like that was also probably really scary it just like so scary and violent and painful and awful and I'm really sad yeah so do you think it was the same thing that like is chasing him that got her or like no no Partially because I think one of them mentions, like, these don't seem like the type to eat you. I think Rose mentions it like that or something. Mm, that's right. I kind of think that the people we saw in the vi- in the dream visions mm-hmm. and possibly other people are, like, sending others and different things to try to kill whoever's in the house, to try to establish a better claim. So I think that the whoever managed to kill Molly isn't actually the people who have found Blake. Okay. To, to, to bring things up, some of the funny sentences that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode were in this section. Um, <laughs> Blake said, I was fully aware of what was going on, which was funny because is he fully aware? Capital A? We don't know. Huh? Um, <laughs> and then he said others were drawing closer, which was also funny. <laughs> Those are the two I wrote. It was real good. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So basically ends up throwing a rock, knocks a hole with Rose's help um, in the pond and gets two of them in there, manages to run to safety, find some random dude on the side of the road that's real concerned. It's like, please let me take you to a hospital. For the love of all things, let me take you to the damn hospital. <laughs> He's like, I'm fine. I just need some... He's like, I don't want to go to the hospital because might be some creepy things coming after me there. I don't know. Yeah, I was curious about that because... Blake kind of understands that these others maybe won't attack him when he's around other people. And I was kind of like, in a hospital, you're going to be around a bunch of other people. But he has a very good point where, like, in a hospital, especially depending on the condition he's in, it might be much more difficult to run away. <laughs> so That and in the condition he's in, it must, might be a lot easier to fake a death. Because mm-hmm. people die in hospitals, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it just might be a lot easier for them to, to fake it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he came up with that excuse or not, though. What did he say? I don't think he mentioned that specifically, but that is a good point. That is a good point. Yeah. Although, yeah, hospitals are good in general, people. (laughs) Pro hospitals. Pro hospitals. Pro vaccine. Yes, pro vaccine. (laughs) Get your COVID shots. Get get all your shots. Get your damn flu shot. It's going to make you feel a little, it might make you feel a little under the weather. It's not the actual flu, it's just your body's immune response. But it might not. You know, yeah, I've never felt not. sick after a flu shot. Oh, that, that's good. I have, but it's a lot better than the actual flu because I've gotten the actual flu too. And that sucks like so much freaking worse, man. Anyway, I'll stop talking about hospital stuff now. <laughs> but one last thing I wanted to say about Rose and the ice is, so we don't actually get it confirmed in this. Sh- I mean, it's basically confirmed, but the way it's confirmed that she helps break the ice is Blake realizes how like haggard she looks. Mm hmm. 
because he realizes that he, she exerted that effort that like took energy out of her when she broke the mirror. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that Rose has to use part of her like capital S self because I don't think she has any other power source. And I think that's why she feels so horribly drained because she's using herself to break the to break. things. Sure. It also kind of reminds me of the vision with the rabbit and the girl and she throws the thing and it shatters, which makes me think like, were they were those all through mirrors? Was Rose seeing the thing? I mean, she saw the visions as well. Was it like Blake and Rose? Was it Johannes? Was it like how were these things happening? Were they you all thinking the it's Johannes? Because he was he was sitting there looking at the looking at everything, and he was like, "Don't ignore what you just saw." So, did he see Rose? Did Johannes see Rose? Was it just I just I don't know, man. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Uh, with that, I'd like to move on to your bold and specific prediction for the day. Awesome. So I, yeah, I, I, my goal is to have a bold and specific prediction, or at least, you know, I want a specific prediction every podcast because I think that I have a deep desire to be right. And I want to try to fight that and try to like just say stuff and throw stuff out there by like challenging myself to do this. So this one isn't that exciting, but I think that the, the bird mask others were sent by the family at the table. Like, not the coven, not all the blonde women, but in the vision, the, the family, just the normal family at the table. I have no basis for this. <laughs> the co- So the coven seem more... They don't seem as, like, wildy, animal, pelt, magic-y people. The witch hunters, I think, like to do things themselves. I guess they could be the Irish people. I don't know anything about the rabbit girl. It could be her. She likes frozen ponds. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's the Aboriginal woman. I also don't know if that term's okay to say, and I don't know, but I'm going to keep saying it because that was the word. And I don't think it's Johannes because that's too obvious. Why is jo- okay? All right, you are so. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we're just going to keep going. All right, so we heard it here. Bird antler. Others were sent by the family at the table. All right, we will see if you're right or not. So, when we were talking a little earlier, I think before we were recording, you did mention how Blake's trek, like, or basically Chase, reminded you of Louise and Pale and, like, her chasing um, the Carmine Beast. They're both, at the beginning of the book, um, they're setting the scene, and they're both, like, traveling in the snow through a long distance. They both have to get out of their cars at some point and continue on foot. But kind of some of the distinct differences are like, like, so Louise is very much in physical danger, but like, as she would admit, it's her own fault. It's, it's her medical condition. And like the fact that she's out in the snow and the fact that like, she doesn't have a coat are the things that like pose a danger to Louise. Like the Carmine Beast does not pose a danger and the goblins don't pose a danger, but it's, it's Louise, an aware person, like trudging through the snow determinedly because of the practice at night. Yeah. Whereas Blake is also making a harrowing journey through the snow, has to get out of his car. But Blake is very much in danger from the others who are attacking him slash trying to get him to die in a way that looks like they didn't kill him. And so just a lot of like the cold feeling and the darkness feeling and the the creepy what's going on feeling, the danger feeling, those were all really present in both of these. And I think it's interesting that they both it's yeah, again, two people who are capital a aware trekking through the snow because of the practice at the beginning of the story i guess they, they sort of end a little bit differently blake returns to the realm of the innocence mm-hmm. um and louise of louise does but first she encounters the world of the practice like first she straight up encounters a bunch of people who are like oh lol let's make this like deal so you can like have your memories erased blow by but yeah i just thought it was kind of interesting okay awesome i, I appreciate all your comparison so the karmic law practice continues to haunt me. Um, I decided, well, I wanted to make a bold guess about what these others are. So I was like, uh, where could I maybe find that? Let's make fill out notes on the, the formulas text, the familiar text in pale. Uh, didn't help, but <laughs> they mentioned karmic law like three times. At one point they're like, oh, if you make a familiar, like a karmic law f- other familiar other others that are like really chaotic in nature might not vibe with you and might not want to like interact with you. And I'm just like, what are these things? Like <laughs> what? <laughs> ah! 
ah, like law isn't that orderly, but I guess like fine. Maybe karmic law is. I don't get it, but it's haunting me and it's it's everywhere. And I and it's like he just throws it in there like some little like pepper, like little and it's never it never gets a full example or whatever, which makes me think like, oh, this is the fun Easter egg for all those stupid people who've read not stupid, for all those really great people who've read Pact <laughs> and know what a karmic law practice practitioner other is. So tune in next week to see if while Bo mentioned the karmic law practice in the implements text because if he did and grandma rose is not a karmic law practitioner i will write a fanfic where she is except i won't because i'm a law student but i won't need to because she obviously is. <laughs> slash was all right um now that we're done uh before we get into this discussion question part we just want to say thank you so much for everyone being so welcoming <laughs> basically when we put the Reddit thread up and we joined Discord, we honestly, not like we expected people to be mean or anything, but we didn't expect quite such a warm welcome. So mm -hmm. um, thank you guys. We're really excited to be doing this and glad that so far you seem to like what you're hearing. Yeah, and we especially want to shout out and thank um, everyone at Doof Media. As most of you probably know, they do a lot of like Wild Bow podcast content. And we asked them for advice early on. They were super welcoming and super helpful. And they even gave us a spot on their Discord so that people who like their podcasts can like learn about our podcast. If you're interested in joining their Discord, you can go to doofmedia.com slash Discord. But yeah, it's a free open Discord and you should really check them out if you haven't. They're great. So going back to our discussion question for the previous week. Just as a reminder, it was, how would you compare your first impression of Blake's family with your first impression of the pill protagonist's families? So we got a few good, really good responses. A lot of them were pretty wordy, so we're not going to go through all of them in entirety. But they're all really good, so if you're interested in reading up on the, exactly what each of these users said, go on to Reddit and go to whatever what it was called. Basically, new packed podcast. <laughs> It's our discussion thread for uh, last week. Anyway, our first one we'll go over. Um, and again, I apologize if and when I mispronounce these usernames. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Misi1 basically says, Pack throws us into the deep end. So compare Pale to each of the three protagonists. So for the Kelly family, it feels like they struggle to keep up with who's who, just like the Thorburn family. Um, with the Avery's family, I feel like it's somewhat intentional since they're basically designed to overwhelm her and cause her to slip through the cracks. On the other hand, the messiness of the Thorburn family felt more designed to invoke chaos rather than overwhelm. Then they point out they're a shit family, um, the Thorburn, so they're worth comparing to Verona's. It takes us a while to fully appreciate how shit Brett is and to find out how shit her mom is. Whereas in this first chapter, the Thorburn family are impressively upfront and public about being fucked I suppose there's something to be said for the Ellingsons, Lucy's family, being as good as the Thorburns are bad right from the get-go. Pretty good comparisons there. Um, but Tisserwet says that the biggest difference between the families in Pact and Impale is how they reflect the protagonists. So the Kenneteers families emphasize the different parts of being a child. So Verona emphasizes being powerless. Lucy emphasizes being cared for. And Avery emphasizes like being overlooked. Whereas on the other hand, Blake is an adult and maybe he even kind of became independent before like he was legally recognized as such, but he's coming in as an outsider into like this situation. And so he has power because he's not like constrained or beholden to anyone, but it's also a weakness because he doesn't have these like relationships that would support him. So kind of like the Kenneteers as children and Blake is kind of an adult is, is an interesting uh, comparison that Tisserwat really drew out. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Next, we have Ace of Swords. They basically choose to compare the Thorburns with Verona's family, which makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but um, they basically say Brett didn't come across as badly in his first impression, or at least as badly as we find out that he is later on. Um, whereas the Thorburns definitely show you exactly how crap they are. <laughs> So Ace of Sword goes on to say, I've met several people whom Brett reminded me of. 
hardworking people raised by hardworking parents at a time and in a place where there was hard work all around and everyone had to contribute. And now that they're older, it just seems obvious to them that all the work should be done all the time. However, we find out Brett's not actually one of those people. He doesn't think hard work is normal. He just thinks it's a sacrifice that should be praised. And he's willing for Verona to be doing all of that. All right. And then knowledge underscore nomad talks about how the first chapter of Pact makes it clear that family relationships are going to be a really big deal for Blake and kind of make you wonder why they're such assholes. (laughs) Whereas this is one of my favorite comparisons I've thought of um, or that I've heard. I hadn't thought of it that Brett feels more like the Dursleys before Harry gets his letter in Harry Potter with all the chores and like that sort of abuse. It was kind of really interesting comparison, I thought, but talks about how the the seeds of something darker, this darker relationship are planted and how Miss kind of works as a like mother figure for Verona in particular um, and in like an escape route. It's really interesting. Mm, Yeah, I like that too. (laughs) Um, and last but not least, we have the, the vampire. So they basically talk about impact, see how mysterious the Thorburns were in the first chapter. So, they, you know, we didn't really know anything about the other verse um, when Pact first came out. So didn't really know what the heck was happening. <laughs> so, yeah, and Pale, the fact that's already been introduced to the existence of magic by this. But Blake is capital I innocent and the odd things surrounding Grandma Rose is in a way tied to his family, but he doesn't really get that anything supernatural is going on in the beginning. Basically, the Thorburn family and what Pale Rangers recognize as other verse shenanigans are connected. Anyway, so yeah, this was a pretty interesting discussion question. I think we got some really good responses from that, so thank you guys so much for giving us your input, and we'll keep trying to give you more interesting food for thought, at least when we get to think of the good question. <laughs> yeah, and Like we have said previously, we don't really know what we're doing. So if y'all have feedback for this segment and how we could um, improve it, do you want more? Do you want less? Just let us know nicely. I mean, if you like hearing us fumble awkwardly over, you know, usernames and stuff, then, I mean, that's kind of funny too. So that's fair enough. We'll keep it going. Like we said, we really appreciate all of your enthusiasm and support for our podcast. And we want to shout out the people who take the time to engage with it in this way. So thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, guys. Anyway, let's move on to our discussion question for the week. Basically, we want you to rate Blake's survival skills. You can use a, well, 1 to 10 or, I mean, it, we're not being real strict on, yeah, on you here. Whatever <laughs> metric you think is useful. Whatever you feel like using. You can use, like, you know, like three squirrels out of, I don't know, 12 squirrels. I you can say that. how many days he would have survived um, if he was in Gary Paulson's The Hatchet. Mm-hmm. That's a very random, but I like Blake it. Blake and Brian swap places. I think his name was Brian. I, I'm pretty sure his name was Brian. Wow, that was back in the day. That was a, <laughs> that's a hatchet reference, everyone. Also, as part of the discussion question, if Rose was physically there in his place, how do you think she would have fared? Do you think she would have done just as good, better, died immediately? <laughs> what do you think? Rude. Let us know. <laughs> and also, you can maybe talk about Okay, you don't have to do this at all. But I was thinking, what if Rose wasn't there to help Blake? Slash, what if just Rose was there and Blake wasn't there to help Rose? But you don't yeah. have to do that. You can think of as many combinations about that as you want. Just like, you know, just anything that feels like it just inspires you to talk about that, just go for it. You know, we'd love to hear it. Thanks for listening, guys. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with your friends, and leave a rating and review preferably a good rating but you know can do what you want i guess you can follow us on twitter at pale comparison or send us an email at pale in comparison pod at gmail.com also keep an eye out for our pale in comparison reddit thread where you can answer that discussion question and any other thoughts you have about this episode did you know that plants like humans can run a fever if they're sick bye bye Thank you.